possible. Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to introduce you to multimodal search and how you can integrate it into your application. So by the end of this talk, you'll be able to understand how this works and potentially even build it. Right? And I'll give you code behind the demo as well. So what's happening in this, um, in this quick little demo is basically I'm passing in a, a string of text and it's searching over multimedia files for me. And you'd think that it's searching over the metadata of the multimedia file, right? The description or something like that. But that's not actually what's happening. It's act the database actually understands the content of the video, the audio file, the images, and it matches with the string text that I've got there and it pulls up the most relevant multimedia. And the point of this talk is to explain how, uh, how this is happening and what's going on behind the hood, right? And how vector databases and, and machine learning models are involved in making this come together. All right. Just playing that again one second. Okay, cool. So a little bit about me uh, first. My background is in machine learning. Um, before I was at Weaviate, I was a data scientist. And now I'm working as a, a machine learning developer advocate at Weaviate. And Weaviate is an open source vector database provider. And um, you know, probably the one most important thing to know about me is that I'm super passionate about AI and I don't think it's gonna kill us all, right? This could be famous last words, but uh, I, don't, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, so I like to start my talks off uh, with this. So could I get a show of hands of how many people know what a vector database is, how it works, have you used it before? It's hard to see with the, with the lights, but I think it's about 10, 15%, I think. I saw like six, seven hands. Okay. So I'll start off with the basics. And um, I ran a workshop yesterday. So if you were at the workshop, this will be uh, five, 10 minutes of repetition. But after that, we'll get to new stuff. So how do vector databases work? So I'll start off with the, the commonality of what we already understand. So everybody here probably understands how normal databases work. You can do all sorts of CRUD operations. Their task is to essentially store data for the long term. This is true for a vector database as well, right? The single thing that's different about a vector database is that you do retrieval and search in a vector database using this fuzzy concept of similarity. And the similarity is similar to how, how humans would do retrieval, right? If I went to a library and I asked the librarian, can you bring me out books that have to do with civil engineering? they would be able to recognize books um, that, uh, that are relevant for me and bring those out, right? So this is what I mean by similarity here, but I'll try to define it further. So let's say you've got a, a database of documents. Here I'm just showing you two, right? And you go in and you do search and retrieval over these documents. And let's, let's consider two scenarios, right? First of all, we do traditional keyword search. So in my uh, search bar, I type in the word Python, and it doesn't come back with anything because there is no keyword match in my, uh, in my database. So fundamentally, the problem here is that the database doesn't understand what I mean by the query, by, by the word Python. Uh, I might as well mean the, uh, the animal, right? And so the context uh, is not understood, uh, nor does it understand the content of the stored documents either, right? Uh, if I was to ask a human, they would be able to retrieve the second programming language for data scientists for me. Uh, and they would know that I'm not referring to the animal, I'm referring to the programming language. And so that is what we want to move towards with vector databases. We'd like to be able to do this kind of magical concept of semantic search where the database knows what it stores as well as what we're asking for. So it understands the, uh, the, the context of what I, what I want to know, right? what I want to retrieve. And so with a vector database, this is possible because it understands that the keyword there, Python, is semantically similar uh, to a programming language data scientist, and it retrieves that even though there is no exact string match. So for a normal uh, SQL database, the queries would look something like this, right? Let's say you're interested in major European cities. You could do this. Now, this is a bit of an exaggeration. You could kind of optimize this and get, get better, but I wanted to make my point. So uh, let's just put in all the regular expressions there. So this will bring you back some of the flavors of mentions of uh, major European cities in your, uh, in your database, the equivalent query for a vector database would look something like this. Right? 
And what I want to point out there is the highlighted text here, major European city. Uh, and so if you run this query, you'll get back anything that's even semantically relevant to major European cities. You don't have to spell out all of the different synonyms and different ways of saying the exact same thing because it does this semantic matching of, uh, of what you mean and it retrieves that for you. Right? So I want to go into how this magic uh, works, right? So really, what a vector database is doing is, on the, on the top left hand there, I've got all of my data. This can be emails, this can be images, video, audio files. Those are going to be fed into a machine learning model. We'll talk about the machine learning model in a second, but the point of the machine learning model is to convert our data from human understandable format to machine understandable format. And these are the vectors, right? So these can be anywhere from 300 dimensional vectors to 3000 dimensional vectors. And they capture the meaning of the data uh, and encode it in floating point format, essentially. And the cool thing about these machine learning models is that the vector uh, representations of the data that they generate retain the semantics of the, of the data. And so what this means is that, let's say I've got some mapping out of my vectors onto, onto vector space here. I'm, I'm showing three dimensional, but this is probably at least 200 dimensional, at most around 4,000 dimensional. Uh, with a lot of the companies that are working in this space. But what I mean by retaining the semantics of the data is that if you look at the, the, the word cat, dog, the image of the cat, the green data points, the vector projections are close together uh, for those data points, right? So each one, each one of these vectors is a green dot here and similar data points cluster together, right? So you've got your quadrant or region of animals, pets, you've got your quadrant of fruits and, and so on and so forth. And this is pretty critical uh, in order for vector databases to work. So the way I like to think about it is the machine learning model is essentially similar to a, a Dewey Decimal classification system, uh, one that you would find in a library. Right? So depending on what book you're searching for, you go to this classification system. If it's about civil engineering, it'll tell you what location in the library this, uh, this uh, book should be placed. Right? If it's about uh, architecture or if it's about um, uh, cuisine, it'll be located in a different location. And so this type of ML model tells you where every data point should live in, in this vector space. So effectively, a vector database is basically like a gigantic library that houses all of your data objects. And the vector search engine is a superhuman librarian who you take your queries to. They understand your queries. They understand the context of everything that's stored in the database. And they do this. Uh, superhuman retrieval of objects that are relevant to your query. And so this concept of numbers representing meaning is, uh, shouldn't be foreign to a lot of people. We use this every day, and the most simplest form of this is uh, in the form of RGB colors, right? We have three uh, color channels and a number for each representing the intensity of, that, uh, of the R or the G or the B captures the, the color as well. And so similarly, similar to how you can cluster colors together, so you've got your quadrant or region of red, greens, yellows, you can capture the semantics of, uh, of uh, any type of document, really. And to demonstrate that, what I've done here, uh, I'll show you a demo where I've taken 100,000 Wikipedia articles, and I've structured them, and then I'm going to do a retrieval based on those. Okay, so now we've set up our vector space of data points. So we can take all of our data objects and we can project them into this vector space uh, via the translation using a machine learning model. Now, when it comes to vector search, all we have to do is essentially take the query from the user, project that same query into vector space, and that becomes that pink dot over there. And the question is now, so this query is in the same language as the data. So this could be text, this could be audio, whatever, whatever you'd like, right? whatever the uh, user is interested in searching for. And now the magic of vector search is essentially which green points fall in the proximity of the pink point, right? If they, if they want to do five nearest neighbors retrieval, you take the five closest green dots to the pink dot, and those become your candidates that you return back to the user. And that's all vector search really is. There's some kind of engineering details around how to make this scalable up to billions or trillions of objects where you don't do brute force search over every single uh, data object. But um, those, are, those are just engineering details. We can, we can simply understand it as retrieving objects that are close to the query object there. Um, and there's all sorts of different metrics that you can use here 
But um, for our purpose, we can just measure it as the Euclidean distance, so the, the shortest distance between the green dots and the pink dot over there. So in short, just summarizing everything that we've talked about so far, the entire vector database vector search pipeline looks kind of like this. Right? You start off with your machine learning model, which we'll call the encoder, because it encodes data into, uh, into um, vectors. Your data comes in. It generates vectors, so every data object gets a vector associated with it. So in the vector database, you'll have both your data object along with the corresponding vector object stored. So that goes into your uh, vector database. And then the user comes along with a query, which is in the same format as your data. That data goes through the exact same encoding pathway through the machine learning model. You get your uh, query vector, and that gets projected into your vector database, into vector space, and out come a list of candidates that match uh, as close as possible to your uh, candidate query. And so I, I want to show you guys this demo of 100,000 Wikipedia articles. I won't show the entire setup of, uh, of how I got this set up, but um, I'll show the, the fundamentals of uh, vector search and, and encode. Okay, so vector search is also known as semantic search because you're searching uh, across semantics. Uh, sometimes also known as neural search because we're using neural network and uh, deep learning models to project our queries and our data objects into this vector space. Um, there's, there's some other names for it as well, but you know, de depending on what field people are coming from, they call it uh, differently. But really, the, the, mo the most important thing to understand in this function here is uh, this concept of near text, and this is the query that I want to pass in, right? This is what I was referring to earlier. This can be any natural language uh, sentence that, uh, that you're interested in searching for. Everything else is really just handling the metadata of my, uh, of my object. So in this particular database, um, I have Wikipedia articles. I've got the text for that Wikipedia article. I've got the title, the URL, the views. And then I'm also passing in, uh, I'm asking the vector database for this concept of distance, which will tell me how far away an object is from my, from my search query. So if I'm searching for uh, a cute, fluffy kitten, then um, a car will be far away, but a dog might be closer together. So you can... Uh, measure exactly how far away or how close uh, to your query a, a data point is using this concept of distance. Right? And then you actually run the, uh, run the query, so you're connected to a client. Currently, the database is running uh, in the cloud. And in the other demo that I'll show you, I've actually got it running locally. But in this particular instance, I've got it running in the cloud, and I'll connect to it, and I'll query uh, my particular collection, and then uh, I'll get back three objects that are, uh, that are the closest. Right? Then I've got a function here that just prints things out nicely. And then now you can simply go in and search for any type of uh, query. Right? This is exactly the query. There's no, uh, there's no kind of uh, reprocessing that happens behind the scenes. This query goes exactly into the machine learning model, and that spits out a vector, and it returns me back three out of the 100,000 objects that are in my vector database that are the most semantically similar to this, uh, to this query. And now I don't need to do exact word matching. I don't need to do any of that because it, effectively it's understanding the meaning of the query and matching uh, across the meaning. So it's doing semantic search here. And so you can see here that you get quite relevant things. You can look at the distance as well, uh, depending on that. So here you, you get the closest object, the second closest, and the third closest object as well. Uh, the other interesting thing that I haven't told you about this model is that it's actually multilingual. So it understands more than 100 languages. And what that means is you can pass your query in in pretty much any language, and it'll still be able to get relevant results. So here I'm searching up for uh, good movies in Hindi. And because I've got 100,000 Wikipedia articles, there's something in my database about uh, movies. And, and this works pretty well uh, as well. And so the flexibility of a vector database really is if you have a machine learning model that's trained on uh, on multimodal data or multilingual data, your user can come along and use that as a search query as well because it knows how to translate that concept into, into a vector. Um, a couple more examples. This is vacation spots in Farsi. So I get back relevant results here as well. And then this is uh, great action movies in Chinese. And so uh, this code is all available. I'll, uh, I'll send you guys the details if you'd like to play around with it. Uh, there's a lot more to this notebook uh, showing you all sorts of different searches that you can do with vector databases. So I'd recommend if uh, people are interested, you can have a look. Okay. So the story that we've told so far includes searching over text, uh, multilingual text uh, with vector databases. And this can scale easily up to 
hundreds of uh, millions, billions uh, of, of objects. There's customers that are using this at the uh, 10 billion scale. And um, currently we're trying to push it towards the trillion object scale. So that is really where a vector database comes into play. If you're searching over 1,000 objects, 10,000 objects, you probably don't need a vector database. If you're, if you're hitting 100 million objects or a billion objects, that's where things will significantly slow down to a point where you won't be able to get real-time performance, and that's where a vector database comes in. Um, the other place where a vector database comes in is if you need to search over multimedia. Right? So the example that I showed you at the beginning of the talk where I was putting in uh, different phrases and it was retrieving for me audio files, video files, image files, if you want to search over multimedia, this is also another great application of vector databases. So to motivate a little bit about searching over multimedia and how we enable this with vector databases, let me start to talk about what multimodal models are. And this is really the, the main point of this talk here. So about uh, last year, I'm originally from Toronto. So uh, last year in Toronto, we had a debate uh, between a bunch of leaders in the AI field and the point of the, the, the thing that they were debating was whether or not AI would, be, would pose an existential threat. And then they, they failed to put a time limit on it, so they didn't say whether it was five years or 10 years or 50 years. But I'd like to pose the same question to people here. Right? So who here thinks that AI poses an existential, uh, existential threat? And I'll put a, a time frame on it. We'll just say 10 years. So can I get a show of hands? Only one person. Very optimistic here. I, I, I'm in the same boat, actually. I don't know. So right now, we're in this exponential growth phase. So it's very hard to predict things. But I don't know. Where we are right now, it doesn't, it doesn't seem that it, this is the case, right? And so one of the arguments that was made for people that didn't think that this was the case was, was this, right? If we were in this, uh, if we were in danger of uh, being uh, overtaken by AGI, uh, why don't we currently have AI that can do any of these things that are trivially easy for humans, right? And so we start off with something that's probably the most difficult for humans, driving, and then we go down the list where uh, things get easier, right? Cooking a meal, walking naturally. You can, even things, uh, you can even name things that are easier than this. We don't have AI. We don't have robots that can do this. And the reason why uh, a lot of people think that this is the case is uh, explained using this paradox, right? So if you read the things on the left-hand side, for AI, all of these things are super easy. These are problems that are essentially solved. You can do all sorts of calculus. You can do power iterations. You can do, it can play chess at superhuman levels. Um, you can translate language better than any human can. And AI has already solved this problem. And these are things that are very difficult to teach humans to do. Right? On the right-hand side, though, You've got all of these things that are insanely difficult for AI, right? which are trivially easy for us. Right? The basic senses, walking, running, these are things that, are, that, are, uh, that we don't really need to pay attention to, we, we take for granted. Right? And so the question is why? And one answer, one potential avenue here is multimodality. Humans are multimodal creatures, and multimodality enables this right list of things. And before we imbue our AI with multimodality, it can't really get access to these things that are trivially easy for us, right? So the, the solution here is to think about how humans learn. And so I've got a, I've got a son who's about uh, a year and three months now, and I just observe him and, and look at what he does. And a lot of learning is not really lingual, right? It's multimodal, he touches things, he likes to put things in his mouth, he, he looks at the texture of things, He'll, uh, he'll feel things and he'll smell things. He likes to smell things as well. He only says about five words, right? And the last word he uh, learned was Baba. Uh, and the first word he learned was Mama, right? But um, I don't hold it against him. The difficult things in life, they take time, right? <laughs> the important things as well. So essentially the basis here is that the foundation of human learning is built on multimodal uh, reasoning. And then you have lingual uh, lingual tasks that build on top of this foundation, right? So now he's learning words, but he's learning words that are affiliated, that are connected with a lot of non-lingual concepts, right? He, he knows what a cat looks like. He knows what a dog looks like. And then he identifies that that thing is called a cat or a dog. Right? And so this is the reasoning behind multimodal models, why we need to 
think about multimedia, we need to be able to reason over multimedia. So really the promise of multimodal models, uh, as far as vector databases are concerned, is not only do we need to be able to encode and capture the meaning of text on the, on the top left-hand side, but we need to be able to do that with images, with audio, with video as well. And for now, some of the leading models that allow us to do this are separate. Right? They don't, there, there isn't one universal model that performs well, that understands all these different multimedia formats. But you'll have a state-of-the-art image model, and then you'll have a separate state-of-the-art uh, uh, audio model, and a separate one that understands video. But this is good enough for now, right? This is what we're using in the app that I showed uh, at, the, uh, at the beginning here. And what these effectively do for you is give you the ability to convert this data into, into vectors. And because the initial data formats are very semantically similar, they're all about lines, the corresponding vectors are also quite similar, right? There might be a little bit of plus minus here, but they're all effectively about the, the same topic. Right? And so if you were to do vector search, all of these four data points, these four green dots corresponding to the input format here, would be clustered together, would be relatively in, cl uh, in close proximity. Right? And so this is the, the promise of uh, multimodal models. There's even work, and, and this is not public right now, there's a, this is this spun out of Google, but there's work where you can digitize smell, right? So if you take different molecules, they, they built up this odor map of things that smell uh, different ways, and they showed that they can project different molecules into this vector space of odors, and you can even capture smell. And so the promise of multimodal models is we might have one unified vector space. Before we had text that was clustered together, but now you can take pretty much any modality on the bottom there, starting off with language, images, audio, video, and you can project them all into the same vector space, right? So you can have images and text and audio and video that live in the same vector space. And this is pretty critical because if you can project data points into the same vector space, then you can retrieve them as well based on this concept of proximity. Right? And these are models that exist uh, even today. Right? And this is what, what I'm using in the application that I showed earlier. So you could, this enables, the first thing that it enables, it enables a lot of things, but it enables any to any search. Right? And what I mean by that is you can pass in any one of these uh, data points as queries, one of these four data points as queries, and it, you can project these into the same vector space, and each one of these will generate a, a pink dot for you, and you can then retrieve out the closest multimedia that is, uh, that, that is located near to that uh, pink dot. And this is effectively what's happening behind the scenes in that multimedia search application that I'm showing you. And this is what I meant when I said that it's not searching over the metadata of those concepts, it's actually taking those uh, multimedia files, projecting them into vector space, using a vector database, taking your queries, and then doing retrieval. Uh, I've only showed you the text to any search in the, er in the earlier example, but in the actual demo that I'll show in a second here, I'll even do image queries, video queries, and audio queries. There's a lot of other functionality that this enables as well. So the, the model that I'm using here is from Facebook, and uh, if, anybody, if anybody's interested, that, that's where uh, it comes from. But you can do this cross-modal retrieval, so the humans are really good at this. If I play you the sound of a car honking, you'll get the image of a car in your mind automatically. You'll get the image of it driving away as well. Right? If I play you a train horn, you'll be able to do this uh, multimodal retrieval automatically in your mind. But now you can have uh, apps that can do this as well. You can do embedding space arithmetic. So you can say, I have this image of a pigeon and I have this sound of a motor revving. What image do, do these concepts uh, look like? Right? And then you get back that uh, image on the right-hand side. And all of this seems uh, really magical, but all of this is possible with the technology that we have right now. You can even do this uh, concept of multimodal generation. So you pass in an audio file and you say, generate me an uh, a image that captures the semantics of this uh, audio file. And the goal here, we don't have this right now, but the goal is that if we can do all sorts of multimodal retrieval, then eventually we'll be able to do multimodal reasoning. And this is what humans are really good at, where I don't have to give you all the different senses of uh, if a tiger is coming at you, just seeing it is enough, right? Hearing it is enough to know that you're in danger. 
I don't have to give you all the modalities for you to, uh, for you to understand that you're in trouble. So really what people think they want are large language models. But I would argue what people really want, what they really need are large multimodal models. They need models that are not just masters of language, but models that can understand image, audio, video as well. And so here, let me show you the, the demo of the application that um, I showed earlier. So here, this is the, the base demo that I, uh, that I showed. It's taking the text string here, vectorizing it, and retrieving anything that's in my database that's uh, semantically related to, to this. This is all running locally, by the way, on my, uh, on my Mac. Both the machine learning model, the vector database, everything is running locally. So here, if I search for city car, I get back images, videos, audio here as well. And you can do all sorts of searches. You can, you can also pass in an image as a query. So I'll show you that example here. So let's say we do something like this. This becomes my input query. And then it retrieves for me other images. If there were, so here I'm limiting it to uh, four, uh, four objects returned. So it only returns uh, images for me here. You do another one. It gives back meerkats, this fox that probably no other meerkats in the database. And then I'll also show you uh, audio search here as well. Right? So if we, if we play, let's say, this audio. So if that audio goes in as a query, I get this audio file, I get uh, this video file back. And so currently without vector search, how people do this is exactly by using metadata. They'll describe what's going on in the video and they'll uh, return it if, if uh, it matches. But in order to do that with multimedia input queries as well, you have to describe the multimedia queries. You can't just pass in the audio file. You have to have a descriptor for the audio file. You have to have metadata for the query along with metadata for everything that's already in the database. Right? Yes, question. The, the input of the image, now all of the other inputs went through vectorization. Yes. The input didn't go through it. It still went directly to the, for the direct query against the vector database. No, so the input also went through the vectorizer and it generated a vector. And the things that came out were just the green dots, the objects that were close to the vector of the query. So this is the, the key concept. So the flexibility of a vector database is that any, uh, you can use any model and whatever modalities, whatever multimedia data that that model understands now becomes fair game for your data, for your queries or anything like that. Right? So yes. You, oh, go ahead. If you do like a language query, yeah. it still goes through vectorization? Yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, question? Uh, That's a very good question. So currently, you, you could do that. So you could say, I have audio and I have a video for it. You vectorize them separately, and then you take the average of the corresponding two vectors. But by default, it doesn't handle that right now. This is actually something that we're working on now, and we're thinking about releasing uh, this month, actually. Yeah. That's a good question. So you could even do video search, but I won't show the video search component because the the machine learning model is running on my system and the inference takes a while to generate the vector for that video as well. Um, but uh, I've got video here as well that uh, you can try out. So this entire app is uh, open source and I'll show you where, that, where you can play around with it as well if you guys are interested. Okay. So what I want to talk about now are just some of the applications of multimodal models and, uh, and vector databases together. Right? So one thing let me do here. Let's talk a little bit about this. So there's two applications that I want to talk about uh, that I think are the most pressing. There's already work that's going on in both of these. Uh, the first one is multimodal uh, recommender systems, e-commerce recommender systems. And so I think this is a field that will get revolutionized as a result of having uh, multimodal models, under, models that understand uh, different types of media. So 
to demonstrate this to you, if I just ask you what type of burger you like, right? Currently, how things work is you describe it to me, I encode the, your, your, uh, your preferences using text, and I return to you other burgers that are described the same way, right? So you, you describe it to me in a text string, and that's how currently a lot of, uh, a lot of systems are doing this. Right? Some more advanced systems actually use images as well, right? So they'll ask you in words, and maybe they'll say, okay, there are these, these five burgers, click on the one that you like the most, and they'll capture your preference through images as well. But you could also capture preference by smell, right? So what type of smell do you like? How does it sound? So you, because you have the ability to encode all of these modalities, why not recommend off of those modalities as well? Right? So all of these kind of multimodal, multi-sensory inputs become the identity of what you like. And you can also encode nutritional facts, by the way. There are, there are labs that are working on encoding tables and generating uh, vectors out of these. And now that vector represents the ideal, the perfect burger for you. And you can do this vector search, vector retrieval of, if I have my space of, uh, of all the products that are on my uh, menu, I can project this and retrieve back the three most popular items for you and recommend them to you. Right? And there's also work done around multimedia uh, vectors. So this goes back to the question that was asked earlier. There's nothing that's restraining you uh, from only generating one vector, you could have the taste vector in, in, one, uh, in one object there, you could have the image vector separately, and you can do this multi, uh, multimedia, multi-query uh, retrieval system. And this kind of sounds fantastical, like it doesn't exist, but there's a lot of uh, labs that are actually using this right now. So I'll show you one example from Amazon, but uh, Facebook is doing this, eBay is doing the same thing. Um, they're all working on, uh, on technology that allows you to, to do this retrieval based on uh, multimedia preferences. Right? And the reason why they're interested in doing this is because if you can encode what a person likes across these modalities, you can identify what a customer likes more uniquely. Because now it's not just how it's described, but what it looks like, uh, what it smells like potentially. Right? Because you have these, multi, uh, you have these multi-sensory uh, encodings to, to represent what a person likes. It also allows you to uniquely compare relevance between products. And this is one of the main uh, reasons why uh, Amazon chose to uh, work on this project that I'll show you. Because you can compare across modalities. It's not just description to description, but it's also a description to the way it looks, um, to the way it feels. And then uh, the main aspect here. So if you go into uh, Amazon and you say, I want something that looks like this couch without uh, multimedia search, you would get back other things that are similar. Like you sit on the thing in the middle, you can also sit on the things on the left-hand side, but it's not exactly what you asked for. Right? If you're able to do multimedia search, then you get back exactly what you want, right? Things that not just are described the same way, but also look the same, right? So you can do better retrieval, better, uh, more relevant search in your, uh, in your applications. And so this is a paper from Amazon, there's another one that I've linked here from, uh, from Facebook that uh, if you're interested in, you can have a look at as well. And the second application that, uh, that I want to talk about uh, has to do with multimodal retrieval, augmented generation. How many people here know what retrieval augmented generation is? Okay, a little bit. Okay, so let me describe it to you. Um, this is a concept that was relatively unknown about a year ago, but everybody is talking about it uh, in the machine learning world and uh, in, the, um, in the vector database world. And I feel like as we, get, as we get more accustomed to this, more people from different fields will, uh, will know about this concept. It's relatively simple, it just sounds difficult. But the concept is, let's say you have a large language model and you ask it a question. This is how the majority of people use large language models. You go to ChatGPT, you ask in a question, you, you ask a prompt, and it gives you an answer. Right? What uh, retrieval augmented generation does is, it basically says, if I ask a question and you have no context of, uh, of what I'm asking about, let's say I ask about, I, I work for Microsoft or I work for IBM or something like that, and I ask about the company policies, and they're not uh, publicly open, so the model was never trained on those uh, data points. Right? It doesn't know about the, the, the private kind of um, documents, the enterprise documents that are privy, uh, that the employees are privy to. So what you do is, you give a vector database access to those personal documents, 
you do internal retrieval, and then you say, these are the most relevant uh, documents that you should read before you answer my question. So effectively what you do in this, in this concept of RAG is you say, I've filtered through all of my personal documents and I've retrieved the two or three that are the most relevant for you to know before you can answer this question. And if you didn't have these documents, you wouldn't be able to answer my question. So I kind of stuff my, uh, stuff my prompt, stuff my question with relevant information, relevant filtered documents, and then I say, now you can read over this stuff and this will give you context and then you can answer my question. And so it gives you customized responses without having to train the model on all of this data. And this is what a lot of uh, chatbots now are, are using that uh, almost every company is, uh, is deploying. And, and this is effectively what retrieval augmented generation is. It's called retrieval augmented generation because you're retrieving from a database and then you're augmenting generation from a language model. It's, it's generating text using that retrieved, uh, retrieved context. It's the equivalent of going to a library and doing research before writing a paper or writing, uh, writing something out. Uh, and this is commonly what humans do. Up until now, uh, language models uh, didn't do this. They would have to kind of remember everything from their, from their memory and then pull it out and then, uh, and then give you a co coherent response. It turns out that that's very difficult, especially when you've been trained on the entirety of the internet. So it's a lot easier if you make their jobs uh, easier by just saying, these are the three things that are the most relevant. Just read over these and, and answer the question. So this is practically a very good uh, way to get your language models to work. It reduces hallucinations. It, um, it increases the quality of answers as well. So you're kind of curbing the creativity of the model, but increasing the practical uh, use cases of the model at the same time. So from our perspective, how does this work for, uh, for our vector search pipeline? Everything stays exactly the same. All of my private documents, all of my private data goes into an encoder. Vectors come out that get stored in my vector database. The user comes by and asks a question and it retrieves the five or 10 or three most relevant documents. But now instead of returning those documents back to the user, what I do is send that over to a large language model to use as context. So those can be stuffed into the query uh, or the prompt for the language model, and it now reads over them before it has to answer the question. So the workflow looks something like this. Let's say you've got a billion documents, however many documents you have in your vector database. You take the same prompt that you would ask ChatGPT, you give it to the vector database, and you say, give me anything that you think is relevant to answer this question from across my billions of documents and just give me the top three things that you think are, are semantically related. So you get out these filtered relevant documents and then now that you have your question and the relevant information at both in hand, you go to, and the important thing about this vector database is that it scales, right? Um, you and I can probably retrieve from a PDF if we have one PDF, the relevant context and this is what a lot of people were doing before this. But if I've got thousands of PDFs, I can't really do this, let alone millions or billions. Right? So this is why doing uh, retrieval with a vector database is, um, is pretty scalable. Technically, you don't need a vector database to do this retrieval. You can use any type of database. You can use a relational, non-relational database. This is why companies like MongoDB are also uh, doing uh, retrieval augmented generation. But the reason why a vector database works the best is because the database speaks the same language that the, uh, that the language model is uh, proficient at, right? It, the database can be queried with English and it just so happens that the language model is a master of speaking that same language. So it, it's kind of a, a match that's, uh, that works really well in that regard. Okay, so now that we have our filter documents and we have the question in hand, we can take both of those to the language model and it generates our customized response. Right? And so, the next step of this, if we think about all of the multimodal retrieval and the app that I showed earlier, is why would you just stop at text documents, right? I talk to a lot of companies and they have PDFs, they have diagrams, they have uh, charts, they have images that they want to retrieve as well. And now we're getting these models that not just understand language, but also understand images and text as well. And we have these tools in between that can parse uh, images and, and text from PDFs and that you can store them separately in your database. So then the natural question becomes, 
why would you just stop at textual context, right? A PDF can have uh, images and it can have all sorts of modalities. So then you, if you just have a model that can vectorize all of that modality, then you can actually retrieve those modalities as well, right? And this is the example that I showed earlier where let's say you've got images, audio, video all in the database. You can now send the same prompt. Let's say you're asking about the, how to cook a burger or something like that. And you go in and you have the recipe here as well, but you've got images of, of burgers as well. And you can retrieve those. And then if you have a large multimodal model now, not a language model, but one that understands uh, images, you can send it the image along with the, uh, the text prompt as well. And you can get it to reason over the image and direct it with your text as well. And this is essentially the concept of augmenting your generation not with not just text, but also images and, and audio and, and video. And a lot of companies are going towards this now with um, Google announcing things like Gemini, which understands audio, it also understands uh, images as well. Uh, OpenAI announcing GPT-4 Vision. There's uh, open source models that can also do this. So it's only, uh, it's only a limited time before this comes to apps all around us. So the last demo that I want to show people here is a large multimodal demo. And this one is pretty recent. This was released, I believe just, it might be this week or late last week. This is a model called Lava. It's a, a language uh, vision assistant model. And it understands both text and images, and it can generate text. So you pass in an image, text, it will output text for you. And the reason why this is relevant is because if you have a tool to do retrieval of these modalities, if you can search for images and text, and you have a reasoning engine that can take in text and uh, images, you, you, these make a very dynamic pair, right? So the last demo that I want to show people here is um, this Lava demo. And this is also publicly available online, so you can play with this. So a couple of images that I, that I prepped here. And these work quite well, actually. So let me, let's do this one first. So this is a diagram here. Let me zoom into that. Let's go full screen here. Okay, so it's just the diagram and then I'll ask it. Okay, so I'll ask it, describe what you see in the image. And I want you to imagine as if I retrieve that from some database. Here I just kind of dragged and dropped it, but really the, the pipeline would be retrieving something relevant and then going in and, um, and doing this multimodal reasoning. And the difference between the previous version of this and the one that was released uh, this week is that this one reasons really well over words, flowcharts, it can follow logic uh, as well. So it can actually follow all the logic, it understands the yes and no's, the, the logical flow over the diagram as well. And if you pair this with tools that can unstructure and deconstruct PDFs for you, you've essentially got agents that can read over PDFs for you and, and reason over them. And this works quite well. The other one that I want to show you here is, let's say we take, I took a screenshot of, of this app, just the top part here, and I wanted to see if it could generate code for me, um, just the front end code for that. And I was testing it last night and it works pretty well. So let's see this. Um, let's see, can you write code for the website in the image? Let's see if it performs here. I was able to work pretty well last night, so let's see. And this is not even the most powerful uh, language vision model that we have. This is probably the most powerful open source model that we have right now. The most uh, interesting thing I found out uh, found about this is not, not that it could generate this code, but at the end, it also tells you, you know, this is just the front end. There's no back end attached to this. So if you click the buttons, it won't actually do anything. So it, it understands the context of, of what's going on as well.
just take some time. I, I don't think the server that this is uh, launched on is the most powerful. But yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, effectively what I wanted to talk about. Let's give it some time. I'll go back here. That uh, really just uh, ends my talk. If you guys want to, if you're interested in this technology, check us out. Uh, if you have any questions for me, I'll take those now, but you can also connect with me uh, online. And all of the demos that I showed uh, in the talk, you can grab them from here. So I'll just post these uh, right now. So if you want, you can, you can have access to them. All of the demos are, are linked here as well. All right, folks, um, any questions? I think this is done. Yeah, it is done. Okay. Questions? Yes. Um, can you replace a vector? Let's say you vectorize an article of fragment subtext. Yeah. It's out of date, or you put something new. Yeah. Can you replace it? If, you, if the document changes? Yes. So, because a database is exactly that, you can do all you can do any CRUD operation. You can update the vector with the new object. So you say this object that used to have this vector is now updated. Project this into the new space and now get a new vector representation for it. So you can do all sorts of, and all of the CRUD operations are constant time. You can do them in real time. Whether you're scaling up from ten objects to a billion objects, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how do you make sure similar objects end up in with similar vectors? Yeah, and this is a. I could imagine something being rotated in one of the dimensions. Yes. Yeah, this is a great question. So, this is one of the details that I didn't want to, or that I didn't include for this particular talk. But how, they, how you actually train these models is you take all of the different models. So, you can have a text model that is a master of its craft, it understands text. And then you take an image model that is a state-of-the-art image understanding model, and you can have each one for its own modality. So let's say you have six modalities, you'll have six uh, unique models. They all project into separate vectors. But the problem is those vectors cannot be, cannot be plotted together. Even if they're all 3D or 300 dimension, if you put them in the same vector space, a lion and the description of a lion might be all the way in different locations. So the training process to string together these models includes uh, what are positive and negative samples. So in the training process, you tell the model, this is the image representation of a lion, this is the word representation of a lion, pull those two concepts together in vector space, and this is, let's say, a burger, push that away from the lion, right? And so this pushing and pulling of positive and negative examples makes it so that by the time the model is ready and you're doing this multimodal retrieval, it uh, has... Uh, objects or concepts that are closer together, clustered in vector space. Uh, yeah, question? Uh, yeah, so how easy would it be to migrate to a model of your existing database? You, you would have to re-vectorize all of your data in that model. It's, it's similar to asking a question in a language. Let's say you have all of your data in English and then you want to migrate it to French. You would have to translate all of your data into French and then you would have to translate your queries into French as well, right? So the, the model is essentially translating. If you use one model, your vectors speak the language of that model. In order to bring out another model, you would essentially have to translate all of your data into that model's language, and then now you can query it. So this is, this is the one thing that you would have to do. Yes, question. Yeah. Yeah. The models are not aware of time. Um, so these large language models have some concept of time, but these embedding models, these models that translate data into vectors, are not aware of time. Uh, but fortunately, we don't need them to be because a vector database cap, uh, kind of accounts for that by doing filtered search. So a vector database does vector search, does this semantic search, but you can also have filter search on top of that. So you can say. I've got my data objects and my vector objects, but I also have a bunch of metadata fields, and I want to filter. I want to say only look over the last six months' worth of data. So you can go from 1,000 objects down to five objects that happened in the last uh, six months, and then retrieve the most relevant concept from there. Right? So we have this pre-filtered search that happens in vector databases where uh, we don't really need the models to handle this type of um, spatial. We have, we have Exactly, exactly. It's a similar. If the data contains events of human history, 
Yeah. Happens during the I don't know ADP. We will have to give them some some metadata. Exactly. And the metadata is not even it, the model doesn't even know that there's metadata. The vector database filters and then selects candidates that it does vector search over afterwards, right? So it's only really us, the, the programmers, that know that I need to filter with respect to this metadata. So for example, if a, if a customer is clicking around and they're interested in buying shoes, if I do vector search, this is one of the fuzzy things about vector search, you, even if you have nothing related to the query, you might get back objects that are the closest, right? Because it has to return back five objects, you might get shirts back. So, one, one thing to do in production is do filtering and say, only look at objects of this category, and then within objects of that category, recommend to me five of the most similar. So you can kind of tame the, the, the wildness of semantic search with filtered search as well, using this concept. Yes? Yeah, so the vector database only ever stores the vector. And all of the data is stored on disk. So the vector database runs in memory, and it's quite RAM hungry. All the other uh, data objects, whether it's video, audio, uh, they're all stored on disk, and they're separate. Yeah. How is uh, looking up the distances between all the stored vectors so fast? Because I would imagine... Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you're doing brute force search, you, that's exactly what you have to do. You, you come in with your query, you come in with the pink dot, and you calculate the distance from the pink dot to every other green dot, every other object that you have. And that's prohibitively slow because you would have to do as many uh, computations as the number of objects in your database. And it's even slower because it depends on the dimensionality of the vectors. If it's a 4,000 dimensional vector, it'll be slower. Um, so how we scale that up is an engineering problem. And what we do is, we make smart choices about what we want to compare to. So we, let's say we have, it's almost like thinking about traveling. If you, want to, if you want to go to London, if you want to come to this conference, you're not going to say, I want to look up all sorts of different locations. I'm going to do this uh, far away comparison first. And then if I say, okay, the conference is located in this proximity, I can do really quick uh, comparisons and distance uh, calculations to the important locations here. I don't have to do comparisons in like, um, I don't know, US or something like that, right? And so th effectively the, um, the algorithm that's running underneath is prioritizing, there's a hierarchy of these are the most important distances to calculate, these other ones are not important in this particular case. And then based on the ones that are important, you, you eliminate a bunch of possibilities so that now rather than comparing to everything, you're only ever comparing to a exponentially small uh, amount of possibilities. And this is what allows it to scale. Otherwise, if you had a billion objects, you would be sitting here all day in, for one search. Right? Yes? So like a simplistic example of that would just be like, if you have a vector that is you know, 4.3, you're only going to look at objects that have uh, that particular dimension, plus or minus you know, 1 or 0.5 of that, and then do the same thing with each dimension, but individually, and then you do full distance. Yes, you, you, exactly. You can think of it that way. The, the, the intuition behind it is, uh, is very similar to that. So you're effectively looking at different regions of vectors, and you're saying, because the query lives in this region, you don't even have to compare it to other regions. You've got enough candidate objects within that region to do comparisons with. Right? Uh, there's a hand up there, yeah? Yeah, so actually the vectors are not the RGB values. One way to understand how the numbers encode meaning is through RGB values, but what the vectors are, are uh, these are outputs from these machine learning models, and the machine learning models have been trained to do some end-level task, right? Uh, let's say I train a machine learning model to differentiate between a cat and a dog, and the model get, becomes an expert at differentiating the, the, the furriness of a cat and the, the, the whiskers of a dog, so on and so forth, right? So when you give it an image, it becomes an expert at extracting or learning features about that image. And those numbers, those features are encoded as these numbers. We don't really understand exactly what 
each feature is for. In the case of RGB, we know exactly what the R channel is, right? It's the intensity of the red. But in, in the vectors that I showed here, we don't really know what the first dimension is uh, related to, what the 2000th dimension is related to. All we know is that because this model has been trained end-to-end -to, -end to classify, and it can classify very accurately, its internal representation of this data must be accurate. And we just use that internal representation. So we can't really understand or, or connect the vector representations to, to real-world concepts. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, okay. So, for words, effectively, how we uh, how we uh, extract um, the the vector representation for this is you can p give it two sentences. Let's say you have a, a sentence about a salad, and then you have a, a second sentence about a burger, and you have a third sentence about um, I don't know Big Ben or something like that, right? And then you do this positive negative pulling in uh, in, um, in in word space, so you can capture, you can encode all words using indices, and you project them into vector space, and then you say, okay, the salad and the burger are similar, so pull those together, and, the, and Big Ben is further away, so push that apart. But effectively, you're just encoding words as, uh, into an index, and then you're turning those into representations. Yes? Yeah. So one way to do that, there's a lot of benchmarks that already tell you that this is a retrieval task. If I give you this query, I know for sure that these are the most relevant objects to return because they're human labeled. And let's say you have a, uh, an embedding model, you have a, a vector model, and you pass it your own data, you, you test it with these benchmarks to see how, how, what accuracy it's getting, right? What recall is it getting? If it's really bad, you don't want to use it because you already know that the benchmarks are the ground truths, right? This is how you can uh, quantify, or this is how, at least in the field, people state this is the best embedding model because it has the best performance on these benchmarks. And there's uh, both image benchmarks, there's uh, text benchmarks as well. Great. Okay, awesome. Thank you, everybody. Maybe I can take a picture here as well. Second.